Hello, I'm Thasmeen Mahfouz, and welcome to Kappa Review. During America's longest war, there were a handful of individuals at the top, deciding how thousands of U.S. troops would combat in Afghanistan, and that direction would change the course of our history. Joining us now is one of those leaders who had an up-close and personal experience with the war in Afghanistan. U.S. Army Major General Retired Jeff Schlosser, thank you so much for being here. He was also the commander of the 101st Airborne Division Afghanistan and is also the author of the book titled Marathon War, Leadership in Combat in Afghanistan. So, sir, following 9-11 and throughout the war, you were actually having one-on-one -on -one briefing sessions with former President George W. Bush. Did you think then we'd be seeing what we are now with a complete takeover of the Taliban in Afghanistan? Absolutely not. I mean, I think all along, to be honest, I, I thought that eventually the Taliban would come and play a political role, you know, maybe as a political party with inside of Afghanistan. But I never thought that you'd see the Taliban back in control of the country. So the U.S. actually abandoned the Bagram Air Base last month. That's the one that you were stationed at. Uh, did you think it was a bad idea to leave that base? I think it was a stunningly bad idea. The combination of leaving the, the largest air base in Afghanistan um, and a much easier area to secure than Kabul International Airport, I think was a very bad idea. That in conjunction with uh, having the four-star commander, uh, General Miller, uh, leave in the middle of July, well prior to all of these evacuations, uh, I thought was a really bad idea. So let's go back to 2008 when you were stationed in Afghanistan. What did a 24-hour period look like for you there, leading thousands of troops there? Yeah, so during those time period, uh, we had about 30,000 troops underneath my command, and they made up not only Americans and not just soldiers, but Marines, airmen, sailors, as well as a variety of different uh, allies, including Poland, France, a large number of those. Uh, I would spend a day, I'd, first I'd normally try to get up, no matter how little sleep I got, I'd try to get up at 5 a.m. and go for a long run, hence the Marathon War, although it actually is a double entendre there. It talks about a long, long war, obviously. Um, and then I would get out and I'd go see troops. I'd fly out. I had Black Hawk, a Black Hawk helicopter uh, constantly at my disposal, and we'd fly out to the usually the Pakistani border, the frontier, and I'd be out there with the troops. Uh, they had often been in combat either that night um, or during that morning, and, and we'd sit and talk, and we and I'd you know look around, make sure I was uh, happy with uh, what they were doing, and I take that back to my headquarters at Bagram. Uh, then almost always in the in the evening, I would be doing advice, uh, strategic call it strategic advice. Often uh, twice a week, or excuse me, every other week, I would speak to um, the Secretary of Defense, Bob Gates. Um, as well as my boss, General Petraeus, as well as uh, Admiral Mullen, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Um, and we would actually go through everything that was happening in my sector of, the, uh, of Afghanistan. Um, and then usually in the evenings, and this was the heartbreaking part, late at night, um, I would try to, uh, I would always go to a, what's called a ramp ceremony. And the soldiers, sailors, Marines, and airmen that were killed that day, uh, we would put uh, their coffins on a C-17 or a C-130, honor them, say a prayer next to them, kneeling next to their coffin, and off they would fly into the night to go back to the uh, Dover Air Force Base. And then really late at night, either I would go over to the hospital to visit the wounded uh, or try to sit down and write a note to the families of the fallen. And uh, that was day after day after day often usually with only two or three hours of sleep at night. But that was a typical day and night uh, in uh, my sector of Afghanistan for me. Yeah, I can't imagine how heartbreaking that is. So in your book, Marathon War, you actually detail an experience where the police and tribal leaders colluded and they attacked your troops even after you set up medical, clinic, medical clinics in the village there. And in your book, you even ask, can this war even be won? Where do you stand on that question at this point? Well, you know, I think, uh, you know, I wrote that, that portion of the book uh, a few years ago. Uh, and I think that that is, in fact, the, the key question as I was leaving Afghanistan that I was trying to mentally deal with as I was uh, still leading soldiers in combat and then going back and talking about it uh, to the American people uh, in uh, 2010. I don't think, I think that was the key question. The idea that uh, a war of this nature could actually be won or could you, in fact, just continue in a minor way, a small way, 
a presence in that country and let the Afghans fight it. That was the dichotomy in my, in my mind. I didn't think at the end that we would win that war the way the American people wanted to see it. In other words, in a timely manner and with a victory rather than uh, essentially a stalemate that allowed the Afghan government to continue in the Afghan army. Of course, that's all gone as well right now. So everyone is now wondering, how did the Taliban take over? And the results are actually even more embarrassing than we thought. Investigations are revealing that the Taliban bought out the Afghan soldiers who are carrying billions of dollars of U.S. supplied equipment. What lessons should we take away from this? Well, I think, first of all, we have a great deal of hubris uh, in America and, and in our military. We think that we can do just about anything if ordered to do so and in, that it's good for America and American citizens. And so we just want to roll up our sleeves and get at it. The fact is, is that when we went into Afghanistan 20 years ago, we really didn't understand the culture. We did not understand uh, the people. And uh, there's a level of endemic corruption that was shocking to me, and it took me a long time to fully understand the ramifications of that corruption. We just saw that over the last two to three weeks, where you actually had uh, Afghan army units, entire units being bought out. Um, of course, I think they were given two options in many case, cases. You know, option A, you die. Uh, option B, uh, you can flee, but we're going to buy you out. We'll give you some a little bit of money, but we're getting all that equipment. Uh, the idea that we can go to anywhere in the world and solve that problem is actually a false idea. And I hope we have a lesson learned uh, from this conflict and the conclusion of it uh, right now that uh, will cause us pause the next time we want to go to a country of this nature and uh, roll up our sleeves and do exactly what I said, and, you know, try to serve America, but also serve that country. U.S. Army Major General Retired Jeff Schlosser, thank you so much again for your time and for your leadership for our country. Thank you so much for having me on the show.